Thank you for joining us. Uh, we talked about maybe moving this event to the Caribbean next year. Uh, yeah, you can watch some cricket and have some good weather. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, if you want to lob a question up here for Satya, please scan the QR code and you can submit a question. But I want to start with a question, Satya, that I know you're just going to love, uh, which is acknowledging this remarkable moment at the end of last week where the market capitalization of Microsoft mm -hmm. surpassed Apple and Microsoft became the most valuable public company in the world. And it just reminded me of a moment in 2010 when Apple's market cap exceeded Microsoft's and Steve Jobs sent an email to employees. And, and he said stocks go up and down, but he wanted to recognize an extraordinary moment. And he said, and remember, Apple is only as good as our next amazing product. I wanted to know, and I suspect the answer is no, whether you acknowledged to Microsoft employees this moment, and if you had how you would finish that sentence, Microsoft is only as good as what? I think you got, Jobs had it right. Um, the, I think if I had to sort of pick up, we're only as good as our ability to execute, prosecute our mission, because in some sense, there's no God-given right for companies to even exist um, forever, right? They have to serve a social purpose. Um, and our mission uh, is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And as, I, I feel that if we're building products, services that speak to that mission in the sense it's relevant to people and organizations, that's, I think, pretty unique about Microsoft. We think about people as first class but we think about institutions and organizations people build to outlast them as also first class. And as long as we are building things for that, then I think we have a right to exist. Did you take even a moment personally or with employees to recognize the... In, in, you know, in my, whatever, 32 years at Microsoft, we have gone up and down. Uh, as, and, and that's why I think the most important thing to focus on is, and, and this is after all a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. So the last thing you want to do is to fixate on a stock price, which we know means nothing in right. terms of what happens tomorrow, especially in our industry, which really has no franchise value, quite frankly. I mean, the problem in, in some sense is for all of us whether we can bet it all on what comes next, uh, which means it's very, very hard. Right, and, and speaking of what comes next, you guys have been fairly aggressive and out in front on adding AI features and capabilities to your products. And yesterday, you made an announcement where you're expanding the rollout of the Copilot tool, uh, fueled partly by your partnership with OpenAI, into Microsoft products like Outlook and Word and Excel. Talk a little bit about that and how widely do you expect those tools to be used? Yeah, I mean, if I step back, um, if you sort of look at um, what has happened even in the last, I would say, 16 months, right? Uh, you have to go back to November of 22 when ChatGPT first came out. I think that was the moment which I like to describe as the, uh, the mosaic-like moment. In fact, interestingly enough, it was November of 93 a uh, year after I joined Microsoft when Mosaic first came out. Um, and uh, I think that's the first AI product that we all could relate to um, and get a real sense of what this generation of AI can do in our lives. Um, but for me, maybe the product that should have really helped crystallize the potential was GitHub Copilot, which probably came six, eight months before that. Um, and especially when we, you know, we scale from GPT-3 to 3.5, um, that's around the time when we felt that if you can take something like uh, software development, which is, let's call it, the most elite knowledge work there is, and have a tool that allows a software developer, in fact, bring joy back to software development, keep them in flow, get them to finish tasks, uh, that to be solidified. In fact, um, uh, the idea that you can have a co-pilot for pretty much every human task. Um, and so we have been on that journey. And we're anchored on two real things, right? The one thing, the breakthrough is the user interface. In fact, 70 years of computing history has always been about can you build that most intuitive user experience? That's kind of how it led to graphical interfaces or the, uh, you know, the multi-touch phone or what have you. But now with natural language, you ultimately, in some sense, have arrived at that point where it's not about us understanding computers, but computers understanding us. Uh, so that's one major breakthrough. The other breakthrough is uh, we now have a new reasoning engine, 
uh, which is a neural reasoning engine because the other 70 year history of computing was we digitize people, places and things and try to make sense of it, reason about it. And so we now have a new capability. So you put these two things together, a new user interface that's much more intuitive, um, you know, grounded in natural language, multi-modal, multi-turn, multi-domain, uh, and a reasoning engine. Pretty much every software category, what is productivity, what is an operating system, what's a browser, uh, they all in some sense collapse. Uh, and so that's why to us, Copilot, uh, just as maybe in the past we were known as an office company or a Windows company or a, a cloud company, I think going forward we will be. We have a co-pilot, we have a co-pilot stack in Azure, which is all the APIs, uh, and that's sort of what our core focus is. Right, now tell us, let's talk a little bit about the relationship with OpenAI and how we should understand it. Um, co-pilot is powered by OpenAI. We saw some instability in the relationship back in November, which, uh, 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 you, you seem to have now come through. Um, is, is Microsoft outsourcing what you're describing as a core capability going forward? And yeah, so I think um, if you sort of step back, um, in fact, it's probably helpful to understand. I grew up in a Microsoft um, yeah, which sort of had these massive partnerships. Uh, the first partnership that at least I joined uh, was around Intel and Microsoft. Uh, I don't think Windows would have existed without Intel, and in, Intel wouldn't have had the success without Windows. Subsequently, in fact, uh, it's interesting, I, I worked on our SQL Server product uh, with SAP. In fact, I don't think SQL so our database would have existed without SAP. Uh, SAP's success uh, of being able to support SQL Server uh, also helped them a lot. Uh, and so in the same way, I think of OpenAI and Microsoft. So I'm used to constructing, in fact, a lot of, People talk about organic development, which of course is the core. People talk about M&A, but sort of not as much is talked about how much enterprise value gets created by partnering effectively. Um, so that's the spirit with which I think about OpenAI. Um, so th there's a whole lot we do. So when you say outsourcing, who's outsourcing what to whom is the real question, right? So we build the compute. Uh, they then use the compute to do the training. We then take that, put it into products. And so in some sense, uh, it's a partnership that is based on each of us really reinforcing mm -hmm. what everyone, uh, each other does. Uh, and then ultimately being competitive in the marketplace. Uh, there are, there's room for, I call it horizontal specialization. There is room for vertical specialization. Sometimes some business models are in vogue. Uh, I'm a big believer in horizontal specialization, uh, especially if you can't vertically integrate everything. Do you have to worry about being over-indexed and over-reliant on a company, a partner, whose ultimate you know, goals and mission might be different from Microsoft's? Look, I mean, you don't go into any partnership. First of all, there is independence in a partnership. There are two different companies uh, answerable to a, two sets of different stakeholders with different interests. So therefore, uh, you have to then create a commercial partnership in it uh, that is mutually beneficial. So that's why I think partnerships where you enter into partnerships where one side is trying to take advantage of the other is not long-term stable. Uh, but if two partners can, uh, and that's sort of why I go back to the history uh, of enterprise value that was created, uh, with partnerships that at least I've been involved in across my career of, uh, at Microsoft. So yes, I think uh, you have to sort of, I feel very, very good about the construct we have. Um, I feel at the same time very capable of uh, controlling our own destiny. Uh, so it's not like uh, that we are single threaded even today on uh, Azure. It, and, and, and this is not about even open AI. It's all about reflection of what our customers want. Every customer who comes to Azure, for example, in fact, our own products, it's not about one model. We care deeply about having the best frontier model, which happens to be, for example, today, GPT-4. Uh, but we also have Mixtral as, uh, uh, as a models as a service inside of Azure. We use uh, Llama in places. We have Pi, which is the best SLM from Microsoft. Uh, so there is going to be diversity of capability and models that we will have, that we will invest in. Uh, but we will partner very, very deeply with OpenAI. What is the right operating model for a company like OpenAI. I mean, currently it's a capped for-profit company owned by a nonprofit, a very unorthodox arrangement, probably contributed to some of the drama and instability in November. Have they figured it out yet? Are you comfortable now that you've got a partner with a stable operating model? 
You're talking to Sam later. I am, and I but, will ask him yeah, that as so well. He, I'm, I'm you know, asking he, for your opinion. You know, he's, he, he, he needs to answer that question, and his board, obviously, and I, I'm sure they're working through it. Look, I, 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 I always say this, which is we invested, we partnered when they were whatever they were or, and whatever they are today, right, in terms of uh, being a capped profit, non-profit, what have you. Um, so I'm comfortable. I have no issues with any structure. What we just want is good stability, uh, and and as I said, we don't even need. Like I'm not even interested in a board seat, or we don't need. We we definitely don't have control. We have no. Uh, we just want to have a good commercial partnership, and we want to be investors in the entity in even uh, the way they're structured. So uh, what I would like is good governance and real stability. Mm -hmm. That's it. You have a a board observer non-voting. We were, I was joking backstage, it feels like having somebody at the back, on the back of the bus without a seatbelt. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so I, it doesn't matter to me, right? I mean, the, the board seat is not uh, the critical path at all for us. What is most important, as I said, is we just want a board that cares about open AI uh, on the open AI side. And that's all we care. I mean, like, that's all we can ask for. Um, and we just want stability in the partnership uh, so that we can then continue to invest in it. That's it. I, I'm always a little cautious in these sort of hype cycles in, in Silicon Valley that certain technologies are being kind of overhyped, overpromised. You know, so far, for example, with the integration of ChatGPT into Bing, have the results met your expectations or has it, on, has it been over a little I think if you sort of take the combination of uh, sort of chat GPT usage and even Bing usage uh, or Copilot usage, I think it's at this point you have to sort of ask yourself your own user habit, right? How many times do you go, for example, I think the real question here is the largest software business there is is search, as we know. Um, and the question is, is that stable? Um, I think, like all big things, it'll take time. But I think at this point, the idea that you go to uh, one of these uh, agents that gets you to the answer quicker is pretty clear. Uh, it doesn't mean that search as we know of it today. I mean, Google obviously is super strong. They have the defaults on Apple. They have their own Android defaults. Chrome on Windows is the largest browser share and what have you. So the, it's, a, it's a structurally a fantastic position that they have. Uh, but that said, I think search as we know of it is going to change, and the web as we know of it is going to change. And so we have a real opportunity, whether it's with Bing, but also even independent of Bing, for example, that's why I think about Copilot as our real product, right? To me, um, the, the relationship we all will have with computers is going to be now with an agent, uh, which will be on all your computers. Um, and to me, that I think is going to be the defining category uh, of this next generation. I want to change gears and, and ask you about this year's elections. Um, I think 70 democratic elections around the world, more than half of, of, of people on earth will have access to vote in an election. Uh, Donald Trump yesterday won the Iowa caucuses. I, I know it's, it's sort of fashionable to say that these are the most important elections of our lifetime. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think is at stake for Microsoft, particularly with the US election, and for the safe stewardship of AI, does this feel momentous to you? I, I mean, um, you know, if I step back uh, from AI, I mean, the one thing that, to your core question, as a multinational company, you know, the one thing that I'm always grounded on is we're also an American company. So the state of the United States, politically, economically, socially, uh, and its stature in the world across those dimensions matters a lot. Uh, so I think that, uh, because that's our passport. Uh, when we show up anywhere at the end of the day, we're an American company. Uh, and to the degree to which America has the relationships, they welcome, uh, then they welcome the companies that are, are born in the United States. So that's, I think, the fundamental thing. In that context, obviously in our democratic process, having that process be you know, well administered, uh, that people have trust in it, I think is super important. So we've always, I mean, through the years, we've done a lot around uh, what does it mean uh, to support the democratic process, where it's the support for the parties, it's the support for the election process itself. Of course, the thing in AI, it's not like this is the first election where disinformation or misinformation 
uh, and election interference is going to be a real challenge uh, that we all have to tackle. We as a company have to do our best work, right? Whether in the context of AI, uh, we have lots of initiatives around content IDs and other things that will then help us, uh, you know, at least vouch for the veracity of uh, any content out there. And that's, I think, the work that we need to do. But ultimately, uh, in the democratic process, essentially ensuring the integrity of elections is one of the fundamental challenges we have to face up to. Whichever administration uh, at, uh, takes over, um, they will probably make it more difficult for Microsoft to do business in China. How are, how are you thinking about the technology you develop in China and how long do you think you'll be able to employ engineers working on technologies like AI in China? So I, a couple of things. I mean, China is not a large business for Microsoft. In fact, we, uh, if you sort of look at our P&L even, I think this is one of those things that is probably not as well understood, is it's fundamentally we do business in China in order to support other multinationals going into China. So this is the German automakers or American automakers or you know, CPG firms or what have you around the world. Uh, who depend on having commonality of infrastructure between the rest of the world and China uh, depend on Microsoft and that's why in some sense we have to be in China in order to support our customers. And the same is true of Chinese multinationals going outside of China as well. And so th that's really our business. So there is not a, a domestic business that we have that's to speak of. Um, in terms of human capital, the way I look at it and say is the, the, the greatness of the United States has been all about uh, being able to attract the best talent. We definitely want people to come to the United States. Uh, we want them to work in the United States, but we also want to tap into uh, human capital around the world to be able to contribute to what is essentially American intellectual property at the end of the day. Uh, right now, when I look at some of the machine learning papers and so on, there's as much being written in Mandarin as it is written in, in English. Uh, and so to the degree to which we believe that somehow knowledge creation doesn't have boundaries, and in fact, the worst mistake we could be making is to somehow shut ourselves up. I mean, the lesson of history, at least as I read it, is that the worst mistake any civilization, any society can make is to somehow shut yourself away or off from knowledge that's being created elsewhere. So to us, if there are great, there's great talent in China that wants to work uh, while at Microsoft, contributing to essentially an American company's intellectual property, we welcome it. We, th at the same time, we are very, very clear about sort of, hey, this is our intellectual property. We are definitely not going to have any collaborations that are not. Um, in alignment with my, in, my, in, in the United States' national interest. Okay. Um, I, I want to go back to Microsoft's investment in OpenAI, which is being scrutinized now by the EU and others. Um, it feels to me like, uh, to the extent that there was a holiday for Microsoft in terms of antitrust scrutiny, the holiday has ended. But do you feel like Microsoft going forward will now be more limited in not only the kind of acquisitions it can do, but now the kinds of investments that it can make? Look, I mean, I think it's inevitable that, you know, regulators everywhere, antitrust folks are going to look at, you know, whatever a company of our size and scale does. Um, and so that's why I think in this context, I, I, all I say is if we want competition in AI uh, against, you know, some players who are completely vertically integrated, uh, I think partnerships is one avenue uh, of, in fact, having competition. So I'm sure the regulators will look at it and say, uh, is this a pro-competition um, partnership or not? And to me, I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you don't, if Mike, think about this, right? If Microsoft had not taken the highly risky bet, I mean, this is now all conventional wisdom, but when we made those investments and we, when we backed even uh, OpenAI, went be, you know, all in on a particular form of uh, compute uh, that led to all of these breakthroughs, uh, you know, it would have not been fun. We wouldn't have had what we have. And more importantly, you know, the, the incumbents would have been the winners. Right. It took uh, 21 months for Microsoft's acquisition of Activision to be approved. And then almost, I think it was a couple of weeks later, Adobe's attempted acquisition of Figma was, re was, re or was going to be rejected, they walked away from it. Is the era of big deals over? Um, I think this is where um, perhaps looking at, um, I mean, whenever I talk to any um, uh, antitrust uh, folks, I always ask them, have they talked to venture capitalists? Because I feel um, 
the best way to make sense is not by size of any one company and things, what is a big deal, what is a small deal. There is conventional wisdom. There are no-fly zones. And then every VC you meet will tell you where the no-fly zones. So all you got to do is track, for, because at the end of the day, you want new entrants, right? That's the, the core of making sure you have vibrant competition is that there is room for new entry and new innovation. Uh, and that's where venture money is focused on. And so by category, you look at that. Uh, you'll take productivity, right? Sort of a place where we have, you know, some great success in the past. But think about the number of new companies that have been born even in the last 10, 15 years, right? Zoom, Slack, Notion. I mean, you wake up and there's a big company. Why is that? That is because there's a real opportunity for new entrants. Then you say, okay, how many new search engines have been born? Uh, none. And so to some degree, that I think is the analysis. The unit of analysis is as simple as looking at where is venture money going, in which categories. And gaming, that was, our, you, know, you know, we've been at gaming, we love gaming. In fact, Flight Simulator was created before even Windows. Uh, but we were number three, number four. Uh, and with now Activision, I think we have a chance of being a good publisher, quite frankly, on Sony and Nintendo and uh, PCs and uh, Xbox. And so, yeah, we are excited about that acquisition closing. I'm glad we got it through. Uh, but I think each category by category is the way, view. I want to quickly ask an audience question, and perhaps this audience member went to CES, where there were a lot of AI, of course, was a theme, and there were a lot of AI-powered uh, gadgets that were displayed. Do, do you feel like we're coming to the end of the smartphone era, and what does an AI successor to the smartphone look like, and does Microsoft eventually play in that category? Yeah, I mean, I think I thought CES this year was uh, very interesting. Um, obviously, I, I thought the 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 demo of uh, the Rabbit OS and uh, the device was fantastic. I think I, I must say, after Jobs' uh, pr uh, sort of launch of iPhone, probably one of the most impressive presentations I've seen of capturing the uh, the vision uh, of what is possible going forward for what is an agent-centric um, uh, operating system and interface. And uh, I think that's what everybody's going seeking. Uh, what, which device will make it and so on, um, it's unclear. But I think it's very, very clear that computer, I go back to that, right? If you have a breakthrough in natural interface, uh, where this idea that you have to go one app at a time and all of the cognitive load is with you uh, as a human, uh, does seem like there can be a real breakthrough. Uh, because, you know, in the past when we had the first generation, whether it was Cortana or Alexa or Siri or what have you, um, it was just not, it was too brittle, uh, where we didn't have these transformers, these large language models, uh, whereas now we have, I think, the tech to go and come up with a new app model. And once you have a new interface and a new app model, I think new hardware is also possible. And is that an opportunity for Microsoft, or are you moving Absolutely. away from hardware? I mean, look, I mean, it, for always it's an opportunity for us. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we make hardware today. We have Surface devices. We make mixed reality devices. Uh, the biggest hardware business we happen to have is, is our cloud. Um, we stream from the cloud. So, therefore, I think uh, you'll see us exercise uh, the full stack of it. Last question, since we're out of time on a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart, which is cricket. <laughs> You're sponsoring a league here in the US. How do you convince Americans who can barely get through a soccer game to fall in love with cricket? Well, I mean, you look, you know, there's room uh, in the United States for all kinds of things. Um, uh, but quite honestly, I mean, to us, um, uh, in fact, the interesting since you brought up cricket, actually, the, the, the next World Cup of the T20 is in the United States. I'm looking forward to India and Pakistan. There's an India-Pakistan game in, in New York. Will and, you be uh, going? I, I hope so. If I can get tickets, that is. <laughs> no, no. I think you can probably swing a ticket. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, look, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a sport that, obviously, for us South Asians, it's a big deal. Uh, it's a religion for us, and so we're obsessed about it. I love the sport, and uh, I'm glad that it's now being played even in the United States. In fact, originally, the first test match, I think, was in U.S.-Canada, but after the American Revolution, I think the... Who won? I, I think the U.S. won, and, but, <laughs> but the U.S. rejected cricket uh, as a British sport after the American Revolution, but we can bring it back. Satya, thank you very much. Thank you so much.